I just went up that side to show that I can actually do it. <laughs> Kathy, we really appreciate you. Thank you. Um, you know, as much as anything, as Kathy was speaking, one thing I was struck by was I was thinking about, you know, you, you get these glowing testimonies from these large ministries of, you know, hundreds of people were, were taken care of here and thousands of people were saved people, uh, saved over here and this kind of thing. What Kathy's ministry, what Titus 2 is doing, is exactly what Jesus said the Good Shepherd does. He leaves the 99 to go after the one. And that one is just as important to God as the thousands and the hundreds of thousands. So I praise God for Kathy's ministry. And, and I just want to encourage all of us to be praying that God's spirit would be poured out through there, that lives would be changed, that, that miracles would happen, and that even as we've been studying in the book of Acts, what the Holy Spirit does, just pray that the Holy Spirit gets released in a really, really powerful, manifest way in her ministry. Okay? Now, as we usually do uh, and, and have started doing, is I want to take just a moment before preaching likewise, we want to remember and give thanks for the tithes and the offerings that have come in this week or that people have uh, left in the, in the plate and back there as well. Giving is a part of worship. It's a part of honoring God, and we don't want to just ignore that. So let's just thank God now for those gifts and ask him to multiply those. Lord, you are worthy of every gift that we could give back to you. Because, Lord, at best, it's just a portion of all the goodness that you have poured out upon us. Financial blessings, blessings of friendship, blessings of family. Uh, Lord, in every possible way, you pour your blessings on us. And so our tithes and our offerings that come into this house are just to honor you, to be in obedience to you. Lord, they are a worship to you. And so we lift them up to you now, Lord, we say, and we ask, multiply them for your kingdom, that your work may be accomplished, that the name of Jesus may be exalted. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. One of these days, I'm not going to hit this microphone. But don't hold your breath. <laughs> okay, we're continuing the series in Acts, and we're looking today at Acts chapter 3. So those of you that have your Bibles or electronic devices, I encourage you, pull those out and get ready. And also, uh, pull out your bulletins. Right at the very top is, this very part, is the part that I usually review to begin with. Renowned theologian J.I. Packer, he's the guy that wrote the book Knowing God, by the way. He once said... Were it not for the work of the Holy Spirit, there would be no gospel, no faith, no church, no Christianity in the world at all. We see this in the book of Acts, where the Holy Spirit superintends over the life and growth of the fledgling church. He does this by revealing more of Jesus and bringing glory to his name. Human efforts to advance the kingdom of God will always be inadequate. As evangelist Reinhard Bonnke wryly noted, the less Holy Spirit we have, the more cake and coffee we need to keep the church going. We need more and more of the Holy Spirit because he's the one that builds the church. So looking at Acts chapter 3, and I'm reading from the New King James Version this morning. <clears throat> now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. 
And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us, as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murder to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from the people. Yes, and all the prophets, from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first... God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. That's a pretty good chunk of scripture. The essence of that thought of those verses is really this, that the Holy Spirit that same Holy Spirit we've been talking about now for several weeks. The Holy Spirit glorifies the name of Jesus with power through healing and through preaching. And there's a power to prayer. I want to give this little illustration. And this was actually from quite a number of years back, 1997, uh, in a magazine, actually the uh, that the Associated Press had quoted. The magazine was Religion in the News. And it noted that a California study on the effect of prayer on recovery of heart problems 
that that study demonstrated the power of prayer. About 200 heart patients were assigned to Christians who prayed for them, while an equal number, a control group, received no prayer whatsoever. Neither group knew about the prayers, yet those who received the prayers developed half the complications that those were experienced, of those that were experienced by those in the control group. A similar study by the Dartmouth Medical School examined the effect of prayer on healing when patients prayed for themselves. The death rate six months after bypass surgery was 9% for the general population, but 5% for those who prayed for their own healing. Again, almost half. And none of the deeply religious patients died during the period of the study. Prayer matters. Prayer has power. So looking at the background of the scripture today. As we've touched on several times now, the book of Acts is that bridge between Jesus' life and ministry that we see in the four Gospels and all the rest of the New Testament. And this is what gives us that historical context for all of the letters, for all of the early church, for everything that's happened in history all around the church. Without the book of Acts, we really would not know what the early church looked like. And throughout the book, we also see that presence of the Holy Spirit building the church, and that it's the Holy Spirit that's expanding the kingdom of God through spirit-empowered believers. Now, last week, we looked at the start of the church, unique in its infancy and exceptional circumstances. 3,000 people had been saved by Peter's first sermon, and they were baptized after the Holy Spirit had been poured out on Pentecost and the gift of tongues and all of that, and 3,000 were saved. And then, really, the church started. And they devoted themselves to four things that we looked at that should be the hallmarks of any church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to fellowship with other believers. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, that is, the Lord's Supper, communion, sharing that with each other, celebrating and remembering the death of Jesus Christ for them. And they devoted themselves to prayer. And I can just tell you, even as we move on from this point here, those four things are bedrock for the church. And those are things we always want to make sure we're focusing on. So now jumping into this, the very first thing you have, the request, which is the beggar's request. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And at the end of the last chapter, chapter 2, verse 42, it records that the believers continued daily with one accord in the temple. So the believers were still good Jews. They still went up to the temple They still prayed. They still fellowshiped. I'm sure they shared the word of the Lord there as well. You've got a ready audience. And so they didn't stop being good Jews, even though they were now in Christ. And so Peter and John go to the temple. And a couple things should just be noted here. You know, Jesus had sent out his 12 disciples, and then after that, the 72, two by two, to minister together. And it kind of looks like Peter and John are keeping that same tradition, that same instruction, even though there's no indication from the text that they're anticipating to do any other work than prayer that day, they're still going in partnership, the two of them together. And so if I were to right out of the gate say there's a good application point, I would say it's always good to be a part of of a team. It's always good to have that fellowship, to not be a Lone Ranger Christian whenever we do not have to be on that right there. Christianity is not meant to be a solo experience, neither is ministry. And I want you to notice something else. They were going at the hour of prayer. Now, there were three customary times of prayer in the Jewish temple. There was 9 a.m., noontime, and 3 in the afternoon. And according to how they reckon time, saying that it was the ninth hour, that meant 3 p.m. So it's in the afternoon when they're there. 
Now, aside from the three times of prayer, there were two times of daily sacrifice, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, just before the afternoon prayers. And it's notable that Peter and John were going at the hour of prayer, and it doesn't say they went to the temple at the hour of sacrifice. They realized in Jesus that that sacrificial system had been completed, that the perfect sacrifice of Jesus on the cross had been fulfilled, that even though the sacrifices were still happening in the temple, there was no need for them. They were going for prayer to observe prayer. Verse 2. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of those who entered the temple. You know, the scene is set here immediately. This is a man who has been lame from birth. He's obviously been carried either by friends or family there. And this looks like this has been going on maybe for years. And, you know, it does seem, too, that lots of times with, uh, with people who, who beg uh, other kind of things, they, they have almost got a, they've got sort of their favorite spot, and that's where they're known to be, and that's where they go. And so that's where this man was, right near the gate called Beautiful. And he was sort of a fixture there, carried there in the afternoon, probably after the really bad heat of the day had ended, and he's there begging because he has no other means of supporting himself. Now, beggars were common sights all around Jerusalem and around the temple, just like they are in every city, every town, and especially when you get overseas where poverty is so severe and they don't have medical systems like we have here. There's an awful lot of beggars, lame, blind, These are common things. And what's notable here, you know, we don't even find this out until midway through the next chapter. This man who has been lame from birth is now over 40 years of age. So he's in this impossible situation. It's this common routine, but, you know, this time, and and probably, probably the disciples have walked past this man many, many times. Possibly even Jesus might have walked by him at some point. We don't know. God never called them till that point this day to actually do something specific. And this time, the kingdom of God is going to break through into this man's life like he cannot even anticipate. And we just want to remember that healings and other miracles while we pray for them, they occur on God's timetable as much as we want them to occur immediately when we pray, and sometimes they do. We just need to remember God has his timetable, and we need to remember always that it's about the glory of Jesus. It's always about him. And so if a healing doesn't occur, if other circumstances don't get changed by prayer, don't despair. It just means that God's got his timetable and maybe his answer is just maybe not no, maybe it's just not yet. So the beggar's laid next to a gate that's called Beautiful. And apparently they don't know for sure what this gate is, but they're guessing that it's one that was called the Nicanor Gate. And it passed from the court of the Gentiles, which was the very outer part where only the Gentiles could go. From that point was next to what was called the court of the women, where the women could go, and then you had the court of the men after that kind of steps in there. And if you were not supposed to be in one of those inner courts, the penalty could be death. So they're out there in the court of the Gentiles. They're right by this gate. And, you know, even though I have read this many, many times, I'm like, well, why is this gate called beautiful? And so after all these years, I finally looked it up and found out that Josephus described this gate It was 75 feet high, 60 feet wide, and it was made of Corinthian bronze, and it was adorned with silver and gold plates. It was located on the east side, where the sunlight, when it hit it, 
caused this bright reflection to the crowds that were worshiping there. And some actually s- described this gate as being, with, especially with that Corinthian bronze and all that, that was actually more beautiful than some of the other gates that were covered with gold or silver. That kind of thing. So absolutely, apparently, an amazingly a beautiful sight. And so it's by this gate that this man's laying. And this man, as he's seeing Peter and John come in, he asks for alms. And alms is really just a generic term for charity. It does not necessarily mean a monetary unit or anything like that. But obviously, in this context, he's asking for money. He's asking for some kind of charity. And as they're coming in, a connection is made that's never been made before. And so Peter fixes his eyes on the beggar. And you know something's going to happen there because most of the time, you know, people see a beggar or some other kind of thing, they're looking the other way. He's fixing his eyes there. And it makes you wonder why. Did the Holy Spirit nudge Peter as he's walking by? Probably not the only beggar laying there. So obviously the Holy Spirit nudged his spirit, even though we're not told. There's something I want you to notice here, Peter. Take, pay attention. And so the man gave Peter and John his attention because Peter just said, look at us. And I want you to consider his situation just for a moment. He has been lame since birth. What was it like when he was a child? He couldn't run, he couldn't play with others. Did he dream of being able to do that? Did he dream that maybe somehow his legs, his ankles, his feet would improve, that he could actually stand up? Did he, as he got older, did he just feel waves of despair? Because it's like, I can't work. I'm going to be reduced to a life of begging. I'll never get married. I'm, I'm always going to be dependent on other people to survive. Imagine the despair that this man has felt during his 40 years of life. And he has no hope on this day, except that maybe somebody's going to be kind and give him some money so that he can have food and continue to survive. And I just want you to envision being in the middle of that kind of hopelessness because it will make you appreciate even more what's going to happen for this man. So Peter then says, silver and gold I do not have. Imagine you're a beggar. You've just asked for something, and the guy's looking at you. He even said, look at me. He's like, oh, I don't have that. <laughs> you know, probably for this split second, he's going, well, why did you bother me? Why did you get my hopes up? But Peter kept on talking, didn't skip a beat. And he said, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Peter's words rang out in that courtyard with a command that had power behind it, could not be ignored. And he steps forward to the man, and he took him by his right hand and lifted him up. And immediately the man's feet and ankle bones received strength. Now remember, Peter was a fisherman. He was used to casting heavy nets. He was used to pulling them back. They were water laden. They were filled with fish. And he'd be lifting them up along with the fish into the boat, all that. He's a strong man. Probably lifting this beggar alone would not have been a big challenge for Peter because he was a strong man. But pulling this man up by the power of the Holy Spirit is what he did wasn't his own power. He just grabbed him. And not only as he's pulling it up, if you'll note, it says that as Peter was lifting him up, the man leaped up. His ankles and his feet were strengthened at that moment, instantaneously, even as he's being pulled up, and he leaps up. And a little side note here, too, is that the author, Luke, who is a doctor... He uses kind of specific medical language describing the healing about the man's ankle and foot bones being strengthened. And he also notes that Peter takes the man by the right hand. 
And so it's this attention to detail, even though Luke was not an eyewitness here of any of this. The attention to detail, again, just continues to give us confidence that the gospel records are good and sound and well-researched, and we can trust them because they are that detailed. And they, they were written at a time that those details could have been challenged by eyewitnesses as well. And so the man, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And I want you to note the fullness of this miracle. This man has never walked in his life. It's not even like he was a young child and something happened that caused him to be crippled, and so he had some kind of memory. He literally has never done it. And I can tell you, walking, fancy term is bipedal, that's like two legs, locomotion. And you know what that takes? That takes muscle strength. You move one limb. Some muscles relax. Other muscles have to tighten up simultaneously. You've got balance issues. You know, scientists worked for years and years and years with robotics to try to accomplish bipedal locomotion because of how absolutely intricate it is. And this man accomplishes it in a second. I mean, okay, I'm going to use Josiah Camperman as an illustration. If you, he's just learning how to walk. And you know, there's a reason they call them toddlers, because they're going like this right here. I guarantee you, when this guy le leapt up, he was not going like this. And in fact, even a little factoid that you'd probably never heard of, you know how so many people have low back pain, you know, and some people have a really severe arch in their low backs, all that? You look at a toddler, they have a flat back. Those muscles, that curve, doesn't even develop till about age four or five because of walking, because of not just toddling from side to side, but because of putting legs forward in front of each other. All of this is happening in a moment when God is healing him. So I want you to capture it a little bit, not to get into the weeds on the medical. I just want you to understand what God did on this. In a minute, he accomplished what even it takes children a few years to be able to do. And not only is he walking, he's leaping, and then he's landing without falling. Okay, that's another, you know, skill set as well. And God's given him all those things in a moment, and it's a complete miracle. And so, of course, this man is leaping, and he is shouting praises to God. Back around the 12th century, the story is told of how Thomas Aquinas called on Pope Innocent II. And the Pope was actually counting out a large sum of money when Thomas Aquinas came by. And the Pope said to Thomas, You see, Thomas, the church can no longer say, Silver and gold have I none. True, Holy Father, said Thomas, but neither can she say now, arise and walk. We want to make sure we never lose track of what's important. Riches don't matter. Riches of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God, that's what matters. Which of those two would you choose? And then you have the reaction, which is the reaction of all the people. And they see him walking and praising God, and they knew who it was. They recognized him. He had been a fixture there, essentially. And so as verse 11 notes, all the people ran to them in the porch that's called Solomon's, and other translations will call it Solomon's colonnade, greatly amazed. And there's one thing I can guarantee you, especially at the time of prayer when probably things are a little quieter, that kind of thing, running around and leaping and shouting at the top of your lungs praises to God is going to get some attention. And that's exactly what happened, and that was God's intention here. He wanted attention brought to this. 
Apparently this is a true story. There was a community here in the United States where a Christian church was kind of noted for its loud blaring music and they had did all these things in the community in this one community area and there were lots of children and lots of families and lots of noise and the people in the neighborhood got so tired of the noise and the activity that they like started doing a petition going around to house to house getting neighbors to sign basically asking either to get that church to move out of that area or just keep it down or something like that. And they went to a Jewish neighbor and they asked him to sign the petition. And he said, well, what's the problem? And they responded, these Christians over here are just so noisy. Well, the Jewish man refused to sign the petition. Well, why not, they asked. You're Jewish. You don't even believe in Jesus Christ. And the Jewish man said, I know. But if I believed what those Christians believe, that the Messiah had come, I'd be noisier than they are. I hope we're that way too. I hope we're that excited about Jesus. I hope we're that willing to let people know that the Savior of their soul has come. Now, the porch that's called Solomon's, there was this big temple enclosure at, at, there was a, had a porch and a roof extending along the top back of the, of the temple area, and it was held by two rows of columns, 37 feet high. And the whole porch was actually about 60 feet wide, it would protect worshipers from the rain, it would protect them from the sun, and it was called Solomon's Porch or Solomon's Colonnade. And the reason it was called Solomon's thing was because Zerubbabel, when they were rebuilding the temple from Solomon's temple that had been destroyed, they used some of the fragments of Solomon's temple for constructing the porch. So that's where they are when all this is occurring now, this very huge area. And I want you to look at verses 10 and 11, and 11, which describes the reactions of the people. Wonder, amazement. Words uh, that can also be translated astonishment or dumbfounded, uh, greatly wondering. This miracle defied the words and experiences of the people. And so as all the people are running to Peter, He responds to them, and this is his reply, verses 12 through 16. He's taking advantage as the crowd's gathering around, and his second sermon is every bit as spirit as inspired as his first one was on the day of Pentecost. And there's a lot of similar elements. But one commentator noted this, and I loved this comment. The greatness of Peter's sermon is that it's all about Jesus. The focus of the sermon was not on Peter or anything he did, but all on Jesus. And so he says, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though our own power or godliness had made this man walk? You know, the implication here is they're not just looking at the man, the previously lame man. They're they're looking at Peter and John, and they're probably going, wow, how did they do this? These must be really, really holy people. Are they magicians? Are they all these other kind? You know, you know how the little scuttlebutt can be going there, and Peter just nips it in the bud. And I want you to remember, it was only a few months back at the Last Supper where the apostles were arguing with each other over who was the greatest, who had accomplished the most things. And Jesus probably was just going like this. They've, you know, at the Last Supper, they have still missed the point. Well, they got over it. And Peter is not even going to accept the tiniest, tiniest bit of glory for himself. It's all about Jesus. And then he starts his sermon. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of our fathers. I want you to look at how he's launching into this. As a Jew, speaking to Jews, he's audience specific in his address. And he's also referencing, even as he's talking about Jesus as their 
Messiah, he's referencing the Old Testament covenant that the Jewish people have with Yahweh, their God. So he's giving them this continuity from their roots and showing them this is not a new religion. This is a fulfillment of the promises of the prophets. And just an application point that I would say, whenever we're talking with people about Jesus, look for those areas of commonality. Build on those. What do you have in common with this person? Peter was a Jew. These were Jewish people. They shared a heritage. And that was where he started. And then when he says that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has glorified his servant Jesus, by using that term servant, the people recognize that Peter is using messianic language because they're familiar with Isaiah. And they know those verses about the suffering servant and about God's servant who's going to bring forth justice and healing. So when Peter says his servant, Jesus, Peter is very clearly to their mind stating that Jesus is God's long-awaited Messiah. And then he says, this Jesus, this servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate, when Pilate was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murder to be granted. You killed the prince, the author of life. Now who knows how many people were really in this crowd who had been shouting for Jesus to be crucified. Whether it was just a few or many, didn't matter. Peter's approach is still the same as the last sermon. They are responsible for the death of Jesus who was innocent of all wrongdoing and they wanted a murderer released instead. He's boldly confronting their sin. And you know, the implication, just like us today, it wasn't just the Jews that cried out for Jesus to be crucified. It wasn't just their sin that caused him to be crucified. It was our sin that caused Jesus to have to die on the cross. Our guilt is just as much as theirs. And so these words could apply to us. And it may appear harsh, but he's boldly confronting their sin. He's not giving any feel-good sermon designed to make the people, you know, to please them or anything like that. And as a friend of mine once used to, used to say, you got to get them lost before you can get them saved. So in other words, you've got to get them to recognize the depth of their sin in order to recognize the depth of salvation and the gift that salvation is. And so then Peter continues, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. You know, Peter once again speaks of the resurrection of Jesus as established fact. And that both he and John are witnesses of it. You know, I did jump over one point that I want to go back to here just momentarily. If you look at verses 13 and 14, just the ones we just finished up a moment ago, where Peter is saying, this is your sin, this is what you did. Two times, Peter accuses them of denying Jesus. Exactly the same thing he had done. And I can't wonder, maybe, was he thinking of himself as he's twice said, you denied Jesus an innocent man. You denied God's Messiah. And Peter himself knew that even that depth of sin could be completely wiped away by God and he could be set free. So verse 16. And his name, Jesus' name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him, this man, this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. You know, great emphasis on this whole passage, both here in chapter 3 and in chapter 4, which has to do with the Sanhedrin then busting them, you know, getting on them about the actual healing and, and proclaiming Jesus and all that. Eight times in chapters 3 and 4, the name of Jesus is mentioned. It's a huge 
concept because the name of Jesus signifies his authority here. And the name, just using that term, the name, to a pious Jew, they would use that word, the name, sometimes instead of talking about Yahweh, instead of using his covenantal name because they did not want to desecrate his name. So they would just refer to it as the name. So again, when Peter is saying the name of Jesus, he is saying Jesus is your covenant God. There's no way they could miss that point. And in Jewish thought, a name doesn't just identify or distinguish a person. It expresses the very nature of their being. So the power of a person is present and available in the name of the person. And that's what Peter's meaning when he says, by the name of Jesus, this man has been healed. And there's one other thing to note here. I'd never thought about this. This was mentioned by one of the commentators that I read. Is that when Jesus went around healing, he had no need to appeal to a higher authority such as the name of God, he did it on his own authority because he was God. He always spoke with his own authority because he was God the Son. So then we get the last section here, the rescue. And the reason I called it that is because you could simply call it redemption or this kind of stuff. And this is that second half. Okay, we just got him, got him lost. Now we need to get him saved. And it's like, Peter just takes the thumb screws off a little bit, takes some of the pressure off, and he says, brethren, I know you did it in ignorance, as did your rules. It's like, okay, yes, you sort of knew that you were betraying an innocent man. You had no idea who this innocent man was that you were betraying. And so he throws them a lifeline. They're still guilty for Jesus' death. There still is a penalty for that guilt. But they had committed an unintentional sin that was done out of ignorance. And, you know, it's notable that Peter, as a Jew, speaking to Jews, in the temple where sacrifices for sins are occurring every single day, and in fact, that sacrifice had just occurred less than an hour ago, and he's talking about their unintentional sin. And he's probably alluding to the Old Testament book of Numbers, where you actually, in chapter 15, verses 27 through 31, you have different penalties for unintentional sins versus intentional sins. And the sins for intention, uh, the, the, the penalty for intentional sins was severe. Unintentional sins, it was still a penalty, but it was much lesser. And then as he did in his previous sermon, Peter goes on with the prophetic to highlight that this was God's plan all along and he let them know about it. Chapter, uh, verse 18, but those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. And then you get down, verse 19, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, so the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. William Barclay, who is really an expert on a lot of the ancient stuff, he made this note. Ancient writing was upon papyrus, which was like a, a paper kind of thing. The ink had no acid in it, and so it didn't bite into the paper, that, that, that papyrus, like modern ink does, but it's just simply laid on top until it dried. So to erase the writing, a person simply had to wipe it away with a wet sponge. And so God wipes out the sin of the forgiven man. It's just blotted out like it wasn't even on the page. And that blotting out of sin allows for those times of refreshing from God to come in, where we are renewed, where our strength is renewed, where our weariness is lifted.
And then, as we're going to be finishing up here, Peter goes down, verse 22, for Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you, and it shall be that every soul who will not hear the prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And then he goes on to reinforce that message of Messiah was also spoken by other prophetic voices as well. From Samuel and all those who follow, as many as have spoken and have for also foretold and proclaimed these days. Everything that has happened with Jesus, Peter's very, very clear again. God knew of it ahead of time. He proclaimed it through his prophets. It occurred exactly as he intended it to be. And then ultimately in, in verse 25 where he says, you are the sons of the prophets. This is like an idiom, a, 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 which was basically, it was the idea when it said that they were the sons of the prophets, it meant they were the disciples, the pupils, the followers of the teachings of the, of, of the prophets. Peter's saying to his listeners that they could inherit all the promises and blessings that were subject of those prophecies of old if they would only repent and return to God. God's covenantal blessings, blessings are multiply, multiplied to the people through Messiah Jesus, who saves them from their iniquities as they repent and turn to him. And so we come back, like just I mentioned at the beginning, it's the Holy Spirit that glorifies the name of Jesus with power, through healing, and preaching. And ultimately what matters is what God has done in Jesus for humankind and how humans respond. We must never forget what's most important, who God is, what he has done for us in Christ and how we should respond in obedience. And a final thought. The lame man at the beautiful gate wanted something, but God wanted to give him something much greater. The same was generally true of the Jewish people Peter preached to. They expected the Messiah in a certain way, but God wanted to give them something much greater. They looked for a political and military Messiah and not so much one to turn every one of them from their iniquities. This shows how important it is for us to expect the right things from God. So I just want to ask you, what are you expecting from God today? Let's pray. Lord, like those people who saw a lame man healed, who heard Peter preach, Lord, we want to not come with our own expectations. We want to come and receive new expectations, new insight, new power from you. Lord, may heaven alone capture our eyes and our hearts. May Jesus be that very most and only important thing to us. Lord, may we know nothing other than Jesus, the power of your Holy Spirit, the love of the Father. And Lord, make us effective witnesses for you. May your Holy Spirit work through us just like it worked through Peter and John, just like it worked through the disciples, just like it worked through all those early believers to change the world. Work through us, Lord, for change in our families, 
for change in our communities, for change in our country and our world. For the glory of the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.